Uh, it's been a couple weeks, or a week and a half. If you have not been with us on our Wednesday night service, I just encourage you to go back and listen to them. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of good information that kind of starts setting. Uh, again, we're doing the life and writings of Paul. Um, this service is to make up for the Wednesday night that got canceled by the snow, so we don't want to get behind. Because like I said, this could very well take a whole year to teach. And so I just can't afford to get behind. Um, you know, then it's a year and a half. The slides are on the website. The, the slideshow is on the website, what we're currently at. We'll be updating that as I add more slides. Obviously, I'm going to be adding more slides um, to it, but we're, we're currently to where we are right now, and we're getting ready to start into what we refer to as, I guess, the exegesis or expository uh, uh, into the book of First Thessalonians. And uh, we get in there, we just can't do it. I want to show the map, all right? Now, remember... <clears throat> Paul had his first missionary journey, which was rel relatively short in distance and so forth. And then he, he, he is not long after they got back from the first missionary journey, they, they went out on the second and left out of Antioch and, um, and traveled, ac traveled across um, the region. Okay. Hallelujah. We're not getting up there, huh? We got issues. We have issues. Okay. We have issues. There are issues with this. Program. This is not the easiest thing to do. Uh, running PowerPoint sometimes with a dual projection system is not yeah, as easy. But, but they left out of Antioch and um, moved across the regions. This is where Paul was forbidden by the Holy Ghost to go into um, to um, um, uh, Galatia, and um, he wanted to go to uh, not Galatia, but into uh, Asia. He wanted to go into um, Bithynia. And he, he wasn't, and then they had the vision of the guy crying out, oh, come over into Macedonia unto us. Now, if you're, if you're kind of here, um, this is where Paul started. He worked his way across here. Asia's here. Bithynia's up here. Forbidden by the Holy Ghost going down to Asia. Wanted to go to Bithynia, but he, the Lord wouldn't let him. Then they had the vision of the guy in Macedonia. This is Macedonia over here. Come over unto us. Now, remember what happens in, in Philippi and, and Macedonia. He got beat. You know, thrown in the jail. Okay. Go on down to the slide where the missionary, the first missionary, first, second missionary journeys are. We got it up there. Hallelujah. Now I can maybe show you a little bit better. <coughs> so, here we are. That's good. So he starts at Antioch here and goes up to Tarsus over to Derby, Iconium. And while he, was, he wanted to go into Asia, which is where this, this area of Antioch and, and Perga and Pisidia are, but was resisted. The Holy Ghost told him not to go there. And then, up at the top, upper coast here against the Black Sea is Bithynia, and, and up in Galatia. He wanted to go up there, and didn't, the Lord wouldn't release him. And so he had the dream, and you'll see this very area north of Thessalonica, and Amphipolis is Macedonia, and they heard something in the vision say, come over unto us. <clears throat> so they went there, sailed across to Annapolis, went into Philippi. That's where they got thrown in jail, beaten, and came out, and the jailer got saved. They left there and went over to um, Amphipolis went from there down to Apollonia and then up into Thessalonica. And that's, that's like if they start a church. Okay? The young church started. We covered all this. I'm just kind of, we catch it up. But then the Jews got upset because the church got started. They started lying on them and all that kind of stuff. And so they were sent away and they went to the Berea. And then they, those Jews that were in, Berea, in Thessalonica followed them to Berea and they left Berea and went down um, and traveled down to Athens. And they were in Athens. And at Athens, um, Timothy and Silas, he leaves, he leaves Timothy and Silas in Berea. He goes down there by himself, and then they follow him later. Well, once they get there, Paul is concerned about his young church in Thessalonica. So he sends Timothy back, and in the meantime, he ends up traveling over to Corinth, where he stays for 18 months. And during that 18-month period is where First and Second Thessalonians are written. Okay? And so <clears throat> here's what we have. Paul's in Cor Corinth, kind of waiting for word from Timothy. Timothy shows up and brings this report to Paul of how the church is doing. And so then Paul writes a letter. This letter is written sometime uh, around the year 52, I believe it is, uh, A.D. And um, let me get, get my letters up here, make sure I don't want to give you wrong dates. Th these are all basically es uh, guesses. You know, we're, sometimes they're, they're off a year or so. But First and Second Thessalonians are written around 52 A.D approximately three to six months after the start of the church, the first one. First Thessalonians, somewhere in three to six month period. Second Thessalonians follows two to three months after the first Thessalonians. Okay? Now, so Timothy is, is sent back to check, and Paul just wants to know how they're doing. He just, 
You know, you would, you would. You know, he had to leave. You couldn't stay there and, and watch over him. You got this baby church. He's concerned, so he sends Timothy back. And, <clears throat> and this bunch is also the bunch, remember this? The Bereans are more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word of God with all readiness to mind. So they're babies. The Thessalonian church is a baby church. And um, so, but he sends Timothy back. And then he went in that, and, and I have the outline for this, First Thessalonians. Excuse me. It got cropped, so I'm going to use my guideline on my thing. You won't have the full thing. Sorry, I'll get that taken care of. I'm not sure how it got cropped. So Paul writes, after Timothy's return to him, to the church at Thessalonica, um, to address, commend, uh, and and so forth, um, how they are. Now remember this, we're doing a chronological study. Now I know your Bible has Romans as the first letter after Acts. (coughs) It's not the first letter that Paul wrote. And again, Paul wrote his first letter about 18 years after his conversion. First letter we have record of is First Thessalonians, written approximately 18 years after his conversion, about 34 A.D. or so. So we're we're, we're talking estimates here. We're, you know, again, uh, you you could go to one tra- you could go to one commentary and they're off a year from when I am, or they're plus a year from when I am. It's just you got all these people they, and they all have a, maybe. Well, this 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 scholar says this, this scholar says that, but they're all in the general time frame. Okay, and let's face it. At this point, 51 or 52 don't matter. Okay. It was written a long, stinking time ago. All right. So let's go ahead and get into chapter 1. And Paul, let's let's go through chapter 1. Paul and Sylvanus and Timotheus unto the church of Thessalonica, which which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks always for you making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, uh, for the, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So Paul just writes, on, hey, you're, you guys are the cat's meow. Okay? Paul did also did this. He said, hey, you guys are the cat's meow. You're awesome. Okay? Um, and then he, then he says, and you became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word of, in much affliction with joy in the Holy Ghost, and were ex- in samples to all that believed in Macedonia and Achaia. So he said, hey, you church, you're in Thessalonica, hallelujah, you know, all those that, that in Achaia, you know, and um, where else, what, what else did he say here? <laughs> I just lost four pages, turned over, okay? I just flipped over, lost all, all, my, all my whole place, I got to get back, Okay? In Macedonia, up in this region, down in Achaia, he said, he said look, you're examples to them. The way you're living, you're, you know, the way you're serving the Lord, you're examples to them. That should be our testimony, amen? We should be examples to other people. Glory to God. For from you sounded out the word of only, only, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in everywhere your faith toward God is, uh, to God would is spread abroad, so that we may not speak, any, so that we need not to speak anything, okay? So they're, I mean, they're, they're awesome. I mean, he's, he's telling you, hey, you guys have been a good example. You guys are um, well spoken of. And um, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And so, listen, they, they are, they, they got, they got a, he's telling them that they're, that they're exemplary, they're good examples, they have expectancy, you know. So he, he opens up and he just says, it's just a word of encouragement from their, their, their uh, mentor, the one that got them going. You know, hey, I love you guys. You've you know, you, you got a good heart. You're doing good things. You know, you, you, you're a good example. Uh, you know, I'm not having the right to you, a bunch of bozo jerks, you know, straighten up. And he will tell me, you know, he does say some things later, but, you know, he, he's letting them, hey, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. You've got a good heart for the Lord. Amen? It's really what he's saying. You've got a good heart for the Lord. You know, you're young. Because uh, obviously they, they did some silly stuff because he, he, he spoke in the book of Acts. He says, those guys are more noble than the, the Thessalonians. You know? You know? I'm, I'm sure they probably got wind of that thing too. <laughs> Paul said that Bereans were more noble than us. Hallelujah. And, um, but praise God, you know, Paul, one thing about Paul, he, ta- he called it like he saw it. 
All right? So we have a young church here that's enthusiastic. It's a good example. They got a good heart toward God. That's what Paul's saying in this first chapter. I know you guys are young, you know, but you got, you're enthusiastic. You're a good example. You're well spoken of. And you have a good expectation uh, towards the things of God. Okay? Then he moves into the second chapter. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. Now, what he does here in this next chapter is basically speak of how he nurtured them and how he de- helped develop them. And, and he's basically putting remembrance of, of him as an example. Okay? That it was, now our entering into you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. Remember what happened to them at Philippi? They got beat. And we're bold in God to speak unto you the gospel of God. Now, now remember, we're doing our teaching. We're, telling, we're doing the travels. We're doing where they were. And then we're sharing the letter so you kind of have an idea of what's going on in his life. So when he says, how were we ill entreated? Remember, he was beaten and thrown in jail in Philippi. And then they, they tried to get him to leave. And he didn't want to do it. You know, you, you, you did this in private. We want to be publicly whatever, you know. <clears throat> One thing Paul did, Paul would pull his, Paul had a trump card. I'm a Roman. That shakes people up. You beat me, I'm a Roman? Oh, boy. They're like, please get out of here. Don't tell anybody we beat you. You know, just get out of here. You know, because if, if, if the Romans find out we beat a Roman and we didn't do it justly, we're, we're dead. It's, it was a death sentence. And... um. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile. Now remember this, Paul's basically arguing his case that I didn't come to you with an ulterior motive. And I think ministers need to get back to understanding that our motive is to develop the saints. We can't have ulterior motives. We can't preach things. For our, listen, I, I'm, this, this is really honest now. We cannot be preaching things simply because it'll get us money or make us rich uh, for our own personal gain. We have to preach, uh, even at our own expense, to get the gospel to people and help them grow and help deliver them and bring them into the light. And we can't fudge or, or hedge things because it'll turn people off. You know, well, if I preach, you know, um, that, um, that believing in that believe in um, that abortion is okay, it's going to run people out of my church, I might lose a big giver. You can't hedge the truth because it might cost you in the natural. We have to be honest about the things. And Paul said, I didn't come. I did not come with deceit. I didn't come in uncleanness. I didn't come in guile. But as we were allowed of God to, put, uh, to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. And so Paul was saying, listen, I have a responsibility before God to preach the truth. Men, some men aren't going to like it. Actually, with things we're going on right now in the church, there are a lot of people who don't like it. But we have to teach the truth anyway. Okay? For neither any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is our witness. Nor of men sought we glory, nor of you, nor yet of others, that, because, that when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you as a nurse, nurse cherisheth her children, Okay, and so he's, he's saying here, I was a faithful steward of my calling. I, um, I was like a, like a nursing mother or gentle to you. And so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. He, and they were selling out. It was, if it, it, whatever it cost them, they were selling out to get them um, into the kingdom. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of Christ, of God. Your witnesses. I like this, this statement here. Your witnesses and God also. How holily and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged Every one of you, as a father doth his children. I got to thinking about this. I was reading this and studying this. And, I, you know, listen, I've been trying to get to this one for three weeks. And today I'm finally getting to it. I, was, I thought I would have been here the second week of January, and it didn't even come close. Man, every time I got going through, through, through stuff, I'm like, okay, I ain't getting to it this week. And here we are, it's February the first week, and, I'm, I'm, and it would have been January. It would have been Wednesday night. <clears throat> but look what Paul says. Um, as you know, I exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you 
as a father does his children. What does dads tell the children? You know, look, guys, look, son, you can't, you know, I'm going to charge you. I'm going to comfort you. I'm going to, I'm going to exhort you. But then I'm also going to come back on the backside and say, no, you can't do this and you can't do that. It's going to cost you in the long run. I tell we have we have teachable moments with our kids, as always have. You know? We always, we're always comforting them. We're always exhorting them. But then there's other times we just come out and say, now look, you can't do this kind of thing and expect good things to happen in your life. I charge them. I charge them as a father. So, so we're, we're giving them all those things in their life. You know, you're, you're being comforted. We comfort them when they're hurting. We exhort them, you know, to, to, to step out and to go into their callings and their gifts, and there's things in them that God wants to use, and that, you know, uh, you feel like you don't have anything. You have something. But we also charge them. Because I'm a father, as a, as a father does his children. I charge you, you know. Um, you know, I tell my son, you know, like, you know, he was driving the Jeep last night. I said, now, you can't turn this like you do your car. Yeah. Oh, you don't tell him not to do something that'll hurt him. No. Stupid, you turn it too fast, you're going to flip us. Okay? I didn't call him stupid. But bottom line is, if you, if you go around a curve as fast with this as you do your car, it's top-heavy. It's not stabilized the way your car is. It, it'll... It has a tendency to do this. You can't drive it that way. Well, it's, that's, that's a natural example. There's things in life, and there's, you know, re, how, how you handle relationships and how you handle uh, temptations and things like that. As a father, I charge my son and my daughters, okay, saying this will cost you in the long run, all right? Okay, so Paul said, you know how I comfort you, I exhorted you, but I also charged you as a father does his children. Listen to what he charged them, that you walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. I find, find it, it troubling in the church today that nobody wants to talk about being charged to walk worthy of God. There's a cry for holiness. Now, I'm not talking about natural. I'm not talking about your beehive hairdo or your, your powder makeup or your beehive, I mean your burlap sack dresses. I'm talking about a heart issue where you're separating yourself unto God. And God, and Paul wrote to that church and said, you remember how I charged you to walk worthy of God. That's not, this, this is not bondage. It's not captivity. It's not legalism. It is walking out the inner workings of what it means to be born again in your daily life, in your daily walk. And Paul exhorted and charged them to walk worthy of God. He's not writing to sinners. He's writing to a, a church that's young, and he's reminding them, hey, you remember, I comforted, I exhorted you, but I also charged you as a father, walk worthy of God. Selah. Amen. Who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now for this cause... Also, we thank God without ceasing because you received the word of God, which you heard of us. You received it not as the word of men, but it is in the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in them that believe. Amen. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea and are in Christ Jesus. For ye also suffered like many things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Let me see. They were selling out, and they were caught paying the price for it. Now, I want to say something. Thirty years ago, we, would, we couldn't have said this, and it wouldn't have meant a thing. We could say this, it wouldn't have meant a thing. Persecution in the churches of America 30 years ago was somebody making fun of you. It ain't anymore. It's wide open, rampant persecution. If you go to church and you say you're a Christian, I mean, go to school and do something Christian, you're expelled. <clears throat> you wear a Christian T-shirt at school, you're kicked out and sent home. Yet our president just passed a program and it's giving monies to the schools to teach um, about Islam. Government, not just allowed, government instituted program on teaching a religion. Okay, so now in our military, you don't have to, be, you have to, you don't have to conform to the military, military code of justice. You, have, you can wear your long beard and your turbans as a, as a Muslim in our military. Huh? But you can't wear a cross. You cannot wear, they can't wear a cross. 
So there is a, there is, there's blatant persecution going on now. <clears throat> and that's still not as bad as it's going to get. Now Paul said to them, he said, you know, uh, you've suffered like the churches in Judea suffered. Hallelujah. Who both killed the Lord and killed the prophets and have persecuted us. And please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come against them to the uttermost. Now, there's a lot of people who don't want things going on because they want to hide their sin. They don't want, any, they don't want anything said. They don't want anything done because they want to hide their sin. Um, but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart. Otherwise, Paul says, we're separating you from the physical, but our heart's still with you. Okay? Um, in presence, not in heart, endeavoring the more abundantly to see your face with great He wanted to see him so bad. Okay? Wherefore, wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. Listen to this. Now, somehow or another, we, we faith people get stuff, and, and, but Satan hindered us. Wait, I wouldn't say that. You can't say that's a negative confession. Satan hindered them. He was working contrary to them. He was working against them. He was hindering them to get back there. That's not a negative confession. We need to, we need to really learn what faith is and what, and what good Bible confession is and is not. I don't receive that. Satan didn't hinder us. I think Paul kind of knew what he was talking about. He says Satan hindered them. They couldn't get back. Why? They were run out of town. They were run out of town out of Thessalonica. They got run out of Berea. Those people were trying to do anything they could to stop them. They come behind them every chance they get and mess up things. And uh, that's why Paul wrote this letter. One of the reasons is to make sure he was, he, his message got to them and kept them stable. For what is our hope, or our crown, or our joy, or our rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? In other words, Paul says, hey, all that stuff doesn't matter to us. Our crown, our rejoicing, our hope is the fact that you're saved. And when Jesus comes, you're going to heaven. That's, that's the kind of paraphrase. That's what he's saying. For you are our glory and joy. He'll put up with all that and know that they're going to be going to heaven. Whatever it cost him, whatever, whatever it was costing him in the natural, whatever he, price, price he was paying, it was worth it. Because he had them as his crown of joy and hope. Praise the Lord. That's a word of encouragement, isn't it? Wherefore... When we could no longer forbear, we thought it was good to be left at Athens alone. In other words, remember it said at Athens, he sent Timothy back. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you. And Timothy didn't take the letter. This Timothy went back to, re to encourage them with what Paul had taught them. And comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereto. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that you should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. Well, I'll tell you what, the way some people talk these days, Paul would have been an unbelief preacher. He said, we told you you are going to suffer tribulation, and you did. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter had tempted you, and our labor be in vain. So Paul was concerned. He was concerned that this baby church, because he wasn't there to help guide them and help nurture them, continually that you know maybe something would enter in and, and and get to the people and they would be tempted and they could fall away he was concerned about that you know and any any pastor is if you have a true pastor's heart you are concerned about you know you don't want people to fall away you don't want people to get caught up in something you don't want them to get entangled in something that's going to cause them later down the road cause them trouble <coughs> amen now i've seen people um you know, you, you, try to, you try to help them, and, and you try to teach them, and they, and they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't gotten tangled up in teachings and stuff, and, and you, look, you look at the life of that, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, and, and they're just totally shipwrecked, and you think, oh, Jesus, why wouldn't they listen? Why wouldn't they listen? Because you could have helped them. If they listened, you could have helped them. You don't want people, we don't want people, and this is what Paul was saying. I sent Timothy to make sure you didn't, you didn't fall away. You didn't get entangled in something. And then his labor would have been in vain. Get them all saved, get them serving the Lord, and then, then, then the tempter come and mess them all up, he had labored in vain. He didn't want to have that happen. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and love, that we have a good remembrance of us always. In other words, they, 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 they have good feelings or good thoughts or good remembrances of Paul. Desiring greatly to see us as we also do you, therefore, brother, we were comforted over you. 
and all our affliction and distress by your faith. In other words, it, all the stuff we're going through, man, it brought comfort to us. No, you're still serving the Lord and walking with God and going forward. Amen? For now we live, if we stand fast in the Lord, for what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy or for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. In other words, look, I know there's more to do. I want to be there with you. I want to help you. And we're praying for the opportunity to get back there and do it. And I, and I understand. Now, I'm going to be, the nation of Estonia has such a special place with me. And, uh, and our relationship, my relationship with that nation is just so wonderful. And, and I just long to be able to go back just be, stay with them again and minister to them and, and teach them. It's just something, you know, when, when people love you and they, they, you, know, you minister to them and they want you and, they, and, and you come back and they're, they're just, you've blessed us in the past and we get blessed again. You want to be back with them. Because, you know, you can impart more to them. Because their, their heart towards you is open. Okay, I tell you, one of the hardest things in the door is, is to preach to people who don't want to hear what you've got to say. I mean, it's, just, it's hard. Now, I'm going to tell you, I was, I was, I, there was a group in there saying one time, man, it took me a week to get them loosened up. So when I first went in, it was right after communism. I was standing on the desk preaching like a crazy man. And you see, the Estonians used to say about the Americans that we make faces. They're very stoic. They were Vikings. They were a Viking race, okay? And they were stoic. And they said, Americans make faces. They walk down the street, see somebody go, hey! If they're going to smile, it's going to be real. They used to never smile. Not back then. I'm on the desk preaching, and, you know, and, and, and about the fourth day, they finally loosened up and got in the flow of the Spirit. But I'm telling you, the first few days, it was tough going. Because <coughs> all they're doing is looking at you going, I mean, they're, 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 they're way beyond scrutinizing you. It's hard to preach to that. Hallelujah. All right. That we might perfect which is lacking your faith. Now, God himself and the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way into you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable. How does this word pop up? In holiness. How do we forget that word? He establishes your heart in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. Man, there's a statement made about the return of the Lord. He's going to return for a glorious church having neither spot nor wrinkle or blemish. How do we forget those things? Well, one, one thing happens is we teach positional truth and forego um, present truth. We teach who we are in Christ. We don't teach how we're walking them out in the natural. And so we, we teach things and we take a, one truth and move it to a side of, of the equation that it doesn't belong on. Amen? If you take two five-ounce weights and put one on one side of the balance and the other on the other side of the balance, the balance will balance. If you move one of them to the other side, it'll be out of balance. And what we do most times, we'll take position of who we are in Christ, which is what, really what a lot of some of the teaching is today. It's really an excess of who we are in Christ and move it to living holy and move it onto that side and it becomes out of balance. And the truth of the matter is God wants to perfect holiness in us, in our natural walk, not just in our spirits being born again and, and our spirits alive unto God. He wants our flesh walk to, be, to emulate what's going on on the inside. He wants it to be a representation of that inner work. Not, and see, and listen, some people say, well, it doesn't matter what I do on the outside because of the inner work. No, it does matter. God wants to perfect holiness in your flesh. He, and that doesn't mean you won't make mistakes. It means that we're, we're to strive that way. We're to be walking in that way, okay? All right, and so to the end, he might establish your hearts unblameable, in holiness before God and the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all saints. In other words, when Jesus comes back, he wants you standing there, not just born again and separated in your spirit. He wants your flesh clean. Okay? Furthermore, now, so now Paul moves on. All right? He's going to move out of chapter four, 3 into chapter 4. In a typical Pauline method. All this stuff in this front end of this book is about really cool stuff, isn't it? 
man, we want to encourage you. You're doing this, you're doing that, boom, boom, boom. Now he's going to come back on the last half. Not slam them, but reiterate how to live. How to take all the things I talked about, how wonderful you're doing over here, and make sure that it's applicable to your daily, consistent walk in the Lord so that you are a pleasing to the, and honoring him. He says, furthermore, then, we beseech you. Now, the word beseech is a strong begging term, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, very interesting statement here, that as you've received of us how you ought to walk to please God. Paul said, now, this, he doesn't actually list all the things here. There's some things he says, but one of the things is, he says, when I was with you, I told you what you ought to do and how you ought to walk in order to please God. Now, you've got people who say there's no, there are no commandments except to love one another. I, I, I really beg to differ. Loving one another is a commandment of God. Walking in love is a commandment of God. There's other things. Amen? How to, you remember Jesus said this? He said, I didn't come to, to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. So he didn't say the law wasn't right. He just said that you can't do it in the natural without the aid of the Holy Ghost working through you. And it takes a new birth to be able to walk this out. So the things in the law were, were accurate in that they were wrong. They, let me say this. When Jesus fulfilled the law, it didn't make doing anything under the law right. It didn't make the things the law told you not to do. It didn't make them right. When he fulfilled the law, it did not remove the, the, the wrong status from things the law said were wrong. They were still wrong. But it, there was a way you could, you could live it and overcome it and live victorious from it. Okay. <clears throat> For you know what commandments, plural, we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now, that, verse 3. Now, understand where he's living. He's living in, in a Roman empire. He's living in the Roman empire. They're not that far removed from Rome. Here, here we are over here in Thessalonica. And then there's Italy right over here. Okay. Rome's down there about where the, the word Italy is. Okay. So, so. I know you are, but I'm pointing and it's moving. He was, he was trying to help me out here. Rome is somewhere. Rome is right in here somewhere. We're over here and, and you know, he's writing from Corinth, but Thessalonica is right here, okay? And so we're living in the Roman Empire. Well, the Roman Empire was wholly given to sexual perversion. We know that. I mean, uh, it was considered normal for the upper echelon of society, men, to have a, a, a young boy lover. That was considered normal. At 10, 12 years old, that was their, that was their lover. We take people out back and shoot them over that now. But that was considered normal. Sexual perversion was wide open. If you go back and you see any art from this period that's not Christian art, it is perverse. Homosexuality. Uh, lesbianism, lesbian, lesbian, the word term lesbianism came from an island, uh, and I forgot the name of the island, but it, it, it was the, the, the root word was from les, you know, and that's where that came from. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and so he's writing, to a, he's writing to an arena that sexual sins are rampant. And so he writes uh, in, 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 a, in a time frame and a culture, and so Paul writes here, and he comes right out and he goes, you know the commandments we gave you by the will of God. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, the word fornication covers all sexual sin. It's a general category. Now, there are other places in the different letters that Paul wrote. He separated out and made things specific. But here, he just, he just writes and says, all sexual sin. You're, you're living in, you're living in, 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 in an arena, in a time, and, and whatever. And so I'm telling you, uh, I, you know, God's will is you to sanctify yourself and abstain from this. Okay? All right. That you should abstain from fornication. Next verse. That you sh every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. We need to leave our lives. We need to take our bodies and make sure that we're living, we're keeping them clean from the contamination of the world. All right? Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. We don't. There are so many people who want to be able to say, yeah, I can do this, and it's okay, but, the, but, but we're supposed to be holding our vessel in sanctification and honor. We're not to be like the Gentiles. Hello? 
We're to be different. Did Jesus do something in us or not? Our daily life should show it. Our flesh should show it. Amen. You shouldn't be out there in the, in, in the, in the street saying things you shouldn't say. Laughing at things you shouldn't laugh at. I remember when I was in the eighth grade when our teacher came in. Went, uh, I, I could probably remember his name real quick if I thought about it for a second, but I can't right the second. And he said, you guys want to hear a dirty joke? Well, a bunch of eighth grade boys, of course. You're not saved? You're, yeah. He said, white horse fell in the mud. We're all they were so disappointed. You know, we thought the teacher was really going to get down on the ground with us and, you know, bond with us. That's not bonding. Hello? You know? So Paul writes to them and says, um, we told you how to walk and please the Lord. And God's will for you is to be sanctified. Abstain from fornication. Possess your vessel in honor. Wow. Just, see, it's the same bunch he's writing to about here, they, how that they love the Lord, they're well-spoken of, and all these, kind of, these wonderful things about them. But now he's saying, possess your vessel in honor. In other words, maintain a good testimony. Because people are watching, like we said over in our leadership meeting, people are watching you. They are watching you. You are being watched. See, and I'll be honest with you, can I say something? When we get to the place that we really don't think God's watching us, we won't care if people are watching us or not. God's watching you too, honey. Hello? That's, let me say something. And if you don't think God or you don't really uh, are aware that God's watching you, you're too much of the flesh and not enough in the spirit. This is not a slam. It's a, it's a, it's a point of, of adjustment for you. If you are there, you need to get back more in the spirit and become more aware of the presence of God than you are natural things. That no man go by yon and defraud his brother in any matter because the Lord, <laughs> because the Lord is the avenger of all, su of all such. As we also have forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us to uncleanliness, but unto holiness. Now here Paul warns him. He says, I warned you ahead of time not to defraud your brother because God's the avenger of those who do. That's pretty strong words there. And then he follows that with this. God didn't call you to uncleanliness. This is where I take exception when people say things like, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm under, I'm under grace. Wait a second. God's words, Paul warned him, said, God didn't call you to uncleanliness. He called you to holiness. I warned you not to defraud your brother because God avenges them. These are strong words. What's, what's Paul saying? Listen, you love the Lord. You've got great expectation. You're well spoken of. But make sure that your daily walk lines up with your spiritual walk. That the flesh and the spirit are walking in harmony one with the other. And it's not just, I'm in church and I love the Lord, and you go out there, and it doesn't matter what I do with my flesh, because I love the Lord in there. Paul's saying that doesn't work. For God has not called us to uncleanliness, but unto holiness. He, therefore, that despises, despises not man, but God, who also gave us his Holy Spirit. Praise God. But as touching brotherly love, you need not I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. In other words, they have an inner witness they're supposed to love one another. I, have, I don't have to write to you about that. You know that. And indicated ye it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Now, Paul's basically saying, you don't, I shouldn't have to say anything to you about walking in love. You've already demonstrated that, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Grow in it. Even though you already know it, I'm just going to remind you. <clears throat> why, why is he saying if he doesn't need to? Because people need to be reminded. Amen. That you study, be quiet, do work with your own businesses, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you walk, what's, what's he talking about? People have started selling their businesses because they thought the Lord's coming back any second. Now keep working. Okay? Why? Because you get idle, you'll get in trouble. Hello. Let me tell you something. A busy person don't have time to do certain things. 
Are you here? If you're working sun up to sun down and you're busy the whole time, you don't have time to run out. I, I know someone um, that, that went to, to a, one of the, the uh, stores here in town, saw a girl, went over and had lunch with her at, at, at the local fast food, and went out and committed adultery that afternoon. Met him that day and had the adultery with him that afternoon. Nobody in our church. No, they, 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 they're not in our church. They were, they were not in our church. But I know them. I knew them. See, that's too idle. You've got that much time. You're idle. you got time to go shopping and commit adultery in the middle of the day. You're not busy enough. You need to get busier. And I ain't talking getting busy, busy. I'm talking about being uh, working. Hello. So, and listen, he says, Work with your own hands, we commanded you that you be walk honestly toward them that are without, and that, you have, uh, and that you may have lack of nothing. Now, one of the things that Timothy brought back to Paul was the church of Thessalonica was concerned about people who died in the Lord before he came back. What, did, what was that going to mean? And so Paul, you know, um, kind of chists gear here a little bit and just throws this in here. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up and together and the, meet them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So Paul takes the time <clears throat> because the question had come back, what happens to those who, who are dead before Jesus comes back? And Paul says, hey, and we get this wonderful passage that we always use at funerals and, and different things to comfort people with because this is the word, and this is the first letter Paul wrote. I'm, th I'm glad they had that question because there's been a couple thousand years of the use of this phrase, this, this passage to comfort people who lose loved ones. Glory to God. Amen? Hallelujah. And so we move into the, and then he goes into this. So in this chapter, he starts talking about walking in holiness, walking in love, walking in honesty, walk, and then walking in hope. And then he moves into the next chapter and starts talking about walking in the light. But at the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves perfectly, no perfectly, the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and destruction, I mean peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But you, brother, are not in darkness, and that day shall overtake you as a thief. Now, let me say something here. There's a lot of people teaching a lot of people to live out of the light because it don't matter, and Jesus is going to come back. And I'm going to tell you what, you do not want to be one of the five foolish virgins. Remember Jesus and, and the five foolish virgins and the, five, uh, the, the parable of the ten virgins? Five were foolish and five were wise. And the ones, the, you know, the, the five foolish ones ran out of oil because they weren't prepared. Jesus told this parable, not Pastor Ed. And it was a warning against lack of preparation. In other words, do what Paul's telling us here, stay ready. Dad Hagen used to say this. I, I, I think, you know, this is one of the wisest statements I've ever heard in the church. Because, you know, Christians always go through this. When they first get saved, they get excited about Jesus coming back, and they just think, man, I'm just going to kind of hang out and wait for the Lord. Why prepare? Why get married? Why try to have children? Jesus is coming back. And he, Dad Hagen said this one. He said, he said, live like the Lord's coming back any second. Keep your life, what? what? Possess your vessel in, in uh, holiness and honor or glory, whatever he said. I, can't, I, I just lost it now. But then, Plan like he's not coming back for 50 years. Keep making your plans. Keep living your life. Keep doing the things, you know, as if the Lord's not, you know the Lord's not going to be back until 2050. But live like he'll be back before midnight. In other words, keep your, live your life in, in the integrity and in the, in the, the way you possess your, honor, your vessel, the way you do things. Live like he's, at any second he's coming. Plan like he's coming back for a while, but live like. I always thought that was a good word. You know, so it just, you know, it's because it, it kind of separates areas of your life in, in manageable ways. 
Okay, I'm going to plan on having family and, plan, and keep my plans out there about, you know, because you don't want to be 20 years down the road and go, well, the Lord didn't make it back and I ain't got any plans out there. Okay? Live, just live your life. Keep your, keep your vessel. Possess it in sanctification and honor. But man, make your plans for the future. Make your plans for the big house. Make your plans for the, you know, the grandkids. Make your plans for this. But keep living like, man, he's going to show up any second. All right? Verse 4, but ye brethren are not in darkness that the day should take you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, now wait a second. Now I know that a lot of times people, here, here's, here's, here's why we need to read all things in context and not just cherry pick scriptures. Are y'all with me? Because when we, when we do, there, there, there's, there's two, basically two approaches to studying the Bible. What we refer to as systematic theology, and I believe in doing that. And that is studying subjects, faith, grace, healing, walking in love, uh, you, know, you know, character. All the, you know, so we go get all the different scriptures all over the Bible that refer to those things and do a teaching on it. That's systematic theology. But then you also need to do uh, expository or exegetical studies where you go through the whole of a writing in context, why, where, when it was written, so that, you don't, so that it brings balance when you pull a scripture out. If it doesn't have the right setting around it, you can make it say things it didn't say. Okay? So you could get somebody coming along here and go, we're not children, we're children of the light, we're not, and we're of the day, we're not of the night or of darkness. Praise God! And just go off on that and leave the next verse out. Therefore, let us not sleep as others, but let us watch and be sober. Wow. God's talking about being, having a sobriety in our approach to how we live. You know? For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are, who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. So he's saying, listen, you are of the light. You are of the day. But don't, basically what he says here is don't let that statement allow you to just go to sleep and become lethargic in your walk with the Lord. Amen. That's what he's saying. He's telling us, man, yes, you are, but don't let that, don't, don't take, don't be under the illusion that because you are, you couldn't fall asleep. No, you've got to be watchful. You've got to be aware. Well, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah, but don't use, remember, uh, Jude says that they, turned, they came in and turned the grace of God into las lasciviousness. We, there's so many warnings. Uh, um, don't, don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Man, that's a powerful statement. Yeah, you're free, you're liberated, but don't use it as an occasion to the flesh. You're misinterpreting the meaning of that being, liberate, being liberty, being, being liberated, having liberty. If, you want, if, you, if, you, if your thought is I'm free, and the first thing you think of is how you can take that freedom as an occasion to your flesh, you've missed the point. You've missed the whole point of why that was written. Because the scripture says don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. You know, in other words, we're to be watchful. We're, we want to be the five wise virgins, not the five foolish virgins. We want our wicks trimmed and our lamps full when the Lord returns, not out of oil with no fire. Amen. Y'all getting anything out of this? I am. And they that are drunken are drunk in the night. Let us, those of the, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by, Jesus, by the Lord Jesus who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. He's talking, he's talking about what he's talking about up here, about sleeping. He's talking about being dead, whether we're awake or dead. Okay? We should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves, edify one another, even as also you do. And beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you. 
to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Where do we get this stuff now that if we say anything to anybody about, you know, this is wrong, that it's wrong for us to say anything? He said warn them that are unruly. The Bible teaches us to warn people that are unruly. Why? Because that path is going to lead them to a place that's not going to be good for them in the long run. We're not trying to say, I'm better than you, and, and uh, you watch me. If you live like me, you could be the cool. That's not it at all. I'm to warn you, and you're to warn others that are unruly so that we can snatch them back from a path that's going to be destructive to them. Comfort the feeble by the support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Reju now Paul begins a, a kind of a, a you know, list of things to do. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Now, obviously he doesn't mean pray 24-7. Be have, have a consistent attitude of prayer. Okay? And everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And again, you know, he's not saying, didn't say for everything. He said in everything. There's a big difference. In the midst of tribulation, you give thanks to God. For this is his will in Christ Jesus concerning you. You ain't thanking him for the cancer. You're thanking him in the middle of the cancer. He's your healer, and then he's your answer, and he's your deliverer. Okay? Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Wow. We were, we're at an age in the church where somebody speaks by the unction of the Holy Ghost, and they don't like it, they reject it. Now I'm going to tell you something. We always think prophecy is hunkadory. It's all how great you are. I mean, we think when we get, they get done prophesying, they're going to start singing, How great you are! How great you are! The unction of the Holy Ghost will speak by the Spirit. Amen? Now, when people may prophesy in a congregation, it's going, it's going to be edification or whatever. The people who speak by the unction back in the gift of prophecy, maybe as a minister or whatever, there's going to be times they're going to say stuff that people don't want to hear. And it's not going to be pleasant. Now, I, I, I was there a couple of years after it happened. I remember when Dad one time was in class, there was a guy sitting at the back of the class, and um, he stopped in the middle of the class and said, there's a spirit of death hanging over you. Well, you don't hear that. He didn't get it running around the room. Glory to God. Got a word today. What was it? There's a spirit of death hanging over me. <coughs> now let me, he said, he said, you come see me three times and we can, you can avert this. So after he just walked off the platform after class. Why? Wow. It wasn't his responsibility. That was what he was speaking about the spirit of God. He didn't chase that guy down. He didn't go say, you got to get in my office right now. He said, there's a, there's a cloud of death hanging over you. And if you'll come see me three times, you, you know, this can be averted. So the students went to the guy and asked him, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You gonna go? No, I ain't doing a thing. He died. I said he died. Despise not prophesying. I'm telling you, things spoken by the Spirit of God, they may not be pleasant sometimes. Hello. We were at our Christmas banquet for, for our, um, uh, not Christmas banquet, we were at our, our alumni week banquet. I believe 1982. We had, we had gone back, Jane and I had gone back out for alumni meeting. And back in those days, there were so many of us coming back that they would hold the banquet down at the Assembly Center downtown and have it out in the big middle of part of the, the Coliseum there because you know, Raymond didn't have any big meeting places at that time. And so we're, we're out there, and the, and the lights are down, and you know, they got the banquet table set up. And after you ate, you could go sit up in the, in the seats and stuff or whatever. And, uh, and then you know, Dad was at the head table. And he, stands, he starts talking to the people for a few minutes, and he just stops. Air, another year shall come and go. And there will be those among us that not, will not be here. There are those here tonight that will not be with us. Not that they won't be in the meeting, but they'll be absent from the earth. Wow. Now, it doesn't have to be. And then he started telling what they were doing. All three of them were sexual sins. He says, now, if you'll repent, 
and get right, this won't have to come to pass. Two of them died. One repented. Because we got back the next year. And I'm telling you, he stood up and did it again. Air, another year will come and go. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. We're going to come every year people are going to die? Enjoy the banquet. Despise not prophesying. Take them. Make the adjustments. Boy, I start checking my life. No, 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 no. I ain't even running around on Janie. No, I'm, okay. It's all good. <laughs> We're not to despise. See, prophesying aren't always going to be hunkadory. You're going to travel the nations. You're going to turn nations upside down. You're going to build churches of 20,000 each and all this kind of stuff. You're just great, 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 great. As a matter of fact, if that's all you're getting, I bet you half of it's flesh. Hello? <laughs> I'll never forget, at our ordination service, 1990, I, um, it was a lot for a lot of people. Army, I started in 85, but I was already ordained with Buddy. And in 89, the Lord spoke to me and said, go back to your roots. And so we, uh, we went through the process to become ordained with Ramah. <coughs> and we get to our ordination service, and there's a lot of us there in, old, in the Rooker Memorial. We're lined up couples. Because it's the first time a lot of people have gotten back. They had the big ordination service. So a lot of people have been ordained a couple of years or whatever. But they all got back for that one service, and it was a bunch. We were everywhere. It was just lined up. I think it was about 1,000 people that night. It was a bunch of people. Well, Dad starts out, and I know one of the couples up in that first part of the line. I went to school with his wife. We, we were, his wife and I were friends at school. Janie met, met her, her and her sister. And, <clears throat> you know, we were all just buddies. And uh, the first one he starts out with, I, I lay hands on you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that separates you. Into, I, you've been hard-headed and you don't listen to your wife. Now, this is on camera. They're filming this. Everybody's going to get a copy of this ordination service. Because I've already bought mine ahead of time. Well, you're all excited back there in line. Well, Dad's going to lay hands on us. Hallelujah. You won't, you're hard-headed. You don't listen to your wife. Boom. Smart. Fall out quick. Before more comes. Guess the next guy. I lay my hands on you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to separate you. You're hard-headed too. About the first five couples, he just told me he rebuked all five of them for not listening to their wife. Okay, and by that time, I'm starting to grab Janie's hand and start, I'm fidgeting, I'm, I'm about 70 or 80 couples down the line at least. Yeah, there you go. Something I missed. And he gets about the sixth or seventh when he goes, in the name of Roscopadabia, and he started laying hands on my toes, and I went, <laughs> Hallelujah! I thought, I'll get whatever it is. <coughs> You're just thanking God. What? At least whatever I was, I was doing, ain't going to be on my camera. <laughs> oh, my, despise not prophesying. Nobody despise. See, the, obviously, he's talking about things that aren't good or, or you think are encouraging. They may be very corrective. Come on now. And it might be a situation where what's coming forth may not be appeasing to your flesh or to your soul, but it's good for your spirit and it's good for your, your future. Hello? Y'all here? One guy called up Will Roberts one time, middle of the night, and said, My tent's bigger than yours. I just added 2,000 people. I seat more than you do. And see, the Lord had told Dad to go tell him, You go tell so and so. He's not going to live much longer. To judge himself in his love walk, his, his weight, and his diet. His, his diet, not his weight, his diet, and his. Um, his finances. You could tell me he's not going to live much longer. And he told Brother Gordon Lindsay that, and they, they wrote it down and put it in a vault at Gordon Lindsay's office. And sometime later, he did die and pulled it out. Don't despise it. Make adjustments. When the Spirit of God speaks, let's make adjustments. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but if it was God, it would always be edifying and loving, you know, and it would just be, make me feel good. I, I, I beg to differ. The God will correct you. And the reason he corrects you, but actually that says this, the, the scripture says that whom the Lord doesn't chasten, they are bastards indeed. 
That's what it says. The Lord corrects us because he loves us so that we won't make decisions and we won't travel down paths that bring us into destruction. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. Don't despise the word of the Lord. Receive it. Make adjustments. Make changes. Go forward with the Lord. Do the right thing. Amen. And don't despise. So despise not prophesying. That wasn't in my plan to say. It just kind of came out when I got there. Prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Woo. Well, I mean, they're, I love them and they're brother and Lord. You prove it out. Just because they're a brother and Lord don't mean they're right. Prove it out. Walk it out. Prove it out. Don't look about like you say, don't take it just because I said it. You go prove it out. You go study it out. You go see what the Word has to say about it. Let it be faith to you. Here's a good one. Abstain from all appearance of evil. But I'm free. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Well, my girlfriend just sleeps there at my house all the time. We don't do anything. Now, let me tell you something. Either you're stupid, the person you're talking to is stupid, or everybody's stupid. Oh, we just pray all night. Yeah, you probably do pray. P-R-E-Y. Some of y'all get that later. Anybody get that? Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace shall sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that called you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Now, today we do a handshake. I pray you by the, listen, we had a guy who used to be in our church who chased Janie around all the time. The Bible says greet each other with a holy kiss. He's trying to kiss her all the time on the cheek. Take you out with a two by four. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the brethren. Great the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. Amen. All right.